Well, today our, our scripture comes from the book of Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to read about a time when, when men and women walked around naked and thought nothing of it. Now, I don't know what you think of that, um, but there was a time when there was no shame in being naked, and I would bet there was a time in your life when you were not ashamed to go around naked. I bet it was when you were real little. Um, my, um, when we lived years ago, our boys were little. We lived in Alabama, and our house was right on the main drag of town. I mean, a lot of traffic. And our boys would, would play in mud holes out in the front drive. And, and if they didn't have a bathing suit, they'd strip down, and they would be out there buck naked just playing and having the best time and cars riding by, and it didn't bother them at all. You know, when we're little, it's like that. But then when we get a little older we start wanting to cover up, and for good reason. We start w wanting to cover up because, after all, you're embarrassed. Nakedness is sort of a shameful thing in more ways than one. You know, it's no accident that when, when Jesus was hung on the cross, he was hung there naked idea was that we're going to humiliate him and putting him there without any clothes on is just one more way that we can do that because there is something humiliating there's something that brings up shame in us if we are seen naked in public but let's read about what it was like way back at the very beginning. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 through 11. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man of his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? Now, this is a story I bet you know. I bet you you learned this, this story way back when you were just a little kid. And it's, it's one of the most important stories in the whole Bible because it explains how we got to where we are, how, how we got into the predicament that we're in because in the world we now live in there's sin and with that sin comes shame and the desire to cover up a desire that wasn't there before no need to cover up because there was nothing to cover up hiding among the trees of the garden I wonder, do you know what it's like? Have you ever been there? Have you ever done something you knew was wrong? If you didn't know it before you did it, you knew it right afterwards. And you felt so bad that it's almost like you didn't even want to pray. Not at first, because you just know God's going to be mad. And so Adam and Eve hid themselves among the trees of the garden and 
to this day, to this very day, thousands, maybe millions of people are basically hiding from God. Hiding from God because on a very deep level, they know something's wrong. They know something's not right between them and God, and God is a person to avoid. And so with that in mind, you can see that this passage we read, this story of Adam and Eve, is much, much more than just the story of two people you never met who lived long, long ago. It comes much closer to home than that. It is the story of Adam and Eve. It's also the story of Kathy and Steve. And it's the story of Lance. And it's the story of Bill and John. This is a story we can all plug into. This is one we can all relate to. Now think about the characters in this story. There, there is God. Obviously God is in this story. And then there's the serpent. And I, I think you know who the serpent represents. And then there's Adam and Eve. They are our representative. They're the ones who sinned. And they ate from this tree that changed everything. The Bible calls it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Some translations call it the tree of conscience. And in our language... In contemporary American English, to call it the tree of conscience is perhaps even more accurate. We now have a conscience. We have a sense of good and evil. And when we do wrong, our conscience lets us know. And we feel shamed. Now, that's where you come to the difference between little children and adults. And I already told you a surface difference is that little children will run around in the yard naked and think nothing of it. Adults don't do that. I don't guess any of us do that. But there's more difference. You see, those little children, they've not yet really tasted sin. They're innocent, you might say naive. They don't even really know yet what sin is. Makes me think of this, this story I read. It supposedly happened over in Oklahoma. There was a man who showed up at a farmhouse one day. And nobody was home except little, little Jimmy. And the man was middle-aged, had a scruffy beard, and when the little boy saw him pull up and get out of his truck, he knew something was wrong. And that big burly man walked up and looked at little Jimmy and said, Hey, Jimmy, is your daddy home? No, he went to town. What about your mama? She went to town with, with daddy. What about your brother Howard? Where's Howard? Oh, he went to town with mama and daddy. And the little boy said, but now I might be able to help you. I know where daddy's tools are if you need to borrow them. If there's anything I could help you with or if you want me to, if you want to leave a note, I will make sure they get it. And the big burly man crossed his arms and he mumbled around to himself. And he finally said, well, I tell you, here's what you tell, you tell your daddy. I want to talk to him about his son getting my daughter, his son, Howard. I want to talk about Howard getting my daughter pregnant. And little Jimmy said, well, you're right. You will have to 
talk to him about that. I know he gets 500 for our bull and 50 for a hog. I don't know what he gets for Howard. Can you still remember a time when you thought that way? When you were that innocent? There was a time when you were like that. And in a sense, it was like a a garden. It was a place of innocence. But then you grew older and you experienced sin for yourself. And now you're no longer able to be that innocent again. It's like there's no going back. You, once you go through some doors, there's, there's no going back. And that is where the whole human race is. We went through a door that closed behind us. And now there's no going back to the garden And that would be bad news if that were the only news. But the good news is, the good news, the gospel, the teaching of the Bible from beginning to end is, yes, it's true, you can't go back to the garden. But if you will press ahead and keep going, you can eventually arrive at another garden. The garden of God that's talked about in the book of Revelation. Have you ever thought of it this way? The Bible. The the Bible story starts in a garden. And it ends in a garden. And all the way in between. Between Genesis 3 and Revelation 22. Is where we live. It's life outside the garden. What would it be like if we had never sinned? What would our world be like? What would your life be like? There's really no way to know that. But I do know God sent his son to take away our sin. To take away our sin to take away our shame. And then he takes us by the hand and says, follow me. I'm the way, the truth, the life. Follow me. Jesus said, there's a narrow road that leads to life. You take it. But when you sign up to follow Christ, you take that narrow road. Where does it lead? It leads to a garden. It leads to a paradise. It it leads to heaven. Now, I want to ask you a couple of tough questions here. Related to the scripture we read. The man, the woman, the serpent, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Have you ever asked this question or even thought of it? Why did God create that serpent in the first place. Knowing what the serpent could do or would try to do, and why did God let that serpent into the garden? That's almost like, that's almost as hard a question as why did God make mosquitoes? Why did God create a serpent like that? And What about this tree of knowledge of good and evil? God said, don't touch it. Don't touch it. Stay away from it. And if you got kids, you know how that translates to them. I'm going to touch it. I'm not going to stay away from it. But God put it there. And he did not put a razor wire fence around it that was electrically charged. No. He put it right there where it was accessible. God put us in a situation where there was going to be temptation. He put us in a situation 
where we really could make bad choices and bad things would happen. And then you almost, even if you did not have the New Testament, you would almost wonder, did God have some hidden reason for doing that? Nothing God does is an accident. He knows everything that's going to happen before it happens. Surely he knew what was going to happen. And yet he set this thing up and allowed it to happen. Well, it's only when you get over into the New Testament that it becomes obvious why God put us in that position. Why he put you in the position where you would encounter temptation and sin and be ashamed. But in reference to Genesis 3, here's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 8, verse 20. Romans chapter 8, verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Hear that? This creation... The creatures, we were subjected to this. And it was done in hope. What's that all about? God puts us in a situation where we're likely to sin, but God also says he did this in hope. Here it is. The hope is that when you realize things are not right with you and God, when you get a taste of sin and shame, God's hope is that you will look up and that you will reach out for God and that you'll seek forgiveness and you'll find forgiveness and you will move forward in your life and no longer look back. No longer look back. Do you remember after Adam and Eve left the garden, God put an angel there, the Bible says, with a flaming sword so they could never go back there. And I always thought of that in terms of, well, that's part of the punishment. They can't go back to Eden, and that's true. But you know, there's another Another truth there, too. God didn't want them going back to that tree and sitting down by that tree and spend the rest of their lives thinking, if only I'd not eaten from that tree. Doggone it. Why did we eat from that tree? Look, they ate from the tree. It's time to move on. You ate from the tree. I ate from the tree, and it's not God's will that we sit around for the rest of our lives going over and over and over the bad things we've done and how we wish we could change them. The gospel says you don't have to change them. You can't undo them anyway. So ask God's forgiveness and leave them behind. Because God is not headed backwards. He's headed forwards. And you and I are supposed to be headed backwards. If you don't, if you don't head forwards in life, if you allow yourself to get discouraged because of the sins you have committed in your past, not only will you not go forward, You'll live in a lot of misery right here and right now. Back in January, pretty, pretty terrible thing happened. Shocking thing happened. Happened in Pakistan where a 15-year-old boy heard a man he considered to be a godly man Preach a sermon 
that talked about a specific sin the boy had committed. And he really heaped on the fear and the guilt. And you know what the boy did? He took a scythe. Wing blade, scythe like the grim reaper. And he cut off his own hand. And he put that hand on a tray and carried it to his teacher to demonstrate he was sorry for what he had done. Does stuff like that impress God? It must make God weep. God doesn't want you mutilating yourself over things you've done wrong. That's why Jesus has is, is come. So that you can find forgiveness and so you can move on. But God did allow you to have a free will knowing you were going to fall. Why would God do that? Why would God um, give you the ability to do wrong things and then allow you to do them even though it hurts you? It reminds me of something uh, a man once told me. Um, it was during a, during a time in his life when he was in rebellion against God. He was living uh, a lifestyle that he knew was wrong. And one of the ways he rationalized the way he was living um, was that he said, God... You gave me these desires. How can it be wrong for me to commit these sins if you gave me these desires? And for him, that became a rationalization. But there is some truth there. God does put us in a world where we're prone to sin and we do sin. Think of it this way. Do you remember when your kids were learning to ride a bicycle? I do. I remember one boy and then another getting a bicycle, and for a year they'd ride around on training wheels. But sooner or later, the time's got to come when you take off those training wheels. And I can remember getting down low and running along beside that bicycle wanting to wait till just the right instant when it felt like he had good balance. And I turned him loose. I turned him loose, knowing what was probably going to happen. And you know what happened? Crash. Knees got skinned. Noggins got banged. Tears were shed. And yet, I put him up to that. Was it because I wanted him to fall? No. It was because the only way he was going to learn to ride that bike was to have a few falls. Falling is part of learning to ride a bicycle. When you got a one-year-old learning to walk, how many times do they fall just trying to go from the recliner to the coffee table? before they get it down. When a child is learning to walk and he falls, do you scold him and say, what is wrong with you? Get up. I'm ashamed of you for not being able to walk as old as you are, six months old and still crawling around like that. No, only a monster would do that. Falling is part of learning to walk. And the same is true when it comes to our spiritual walk. Our walk with God. The only people who do not sometimes fall in their walk with God is the people who never started walking with God. And by the way, those people who never started walking with God don't fall. 
they just sort of stay down. And they like to point at those of you who do try to walk with God and fall and point that out and try to make you seem like a hypocrite when in reality, you are sincerely trying to walk but in the process, you just fall sometimes. But that's why we got to have the grace of God. And the grace of God is what picks us up when we fall. To say, it's all right. I still love you. Let's try it again. And he pats us and we moved on. We move on. That's how you learned to walk. Physically, that's how you learn to walk spiritually. Isn't it something that, that, say with a young person, young people are given opportunities to do things that they're not yet mature enough to handle responsibly. I mean, I, um, we just... Bought, got insurance going on one of our boys. And, you know, insurance on teenagers is more expensive. And why is that? It's because they're much more likely to have wrecks. Insurance companies sure know. New drivers are going to have wrecks. And I think about that sometimes. And then I realize, yeah, they're liable to have a fender bender, maybe even something worse. But if I never let them drive... Because I'm afraid they're going to wreck. They'll never learn to drive. God wants you to learn to drive. And he wants you to know that falling is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Failing is not the worst thing that can happen to you. In fact, falling is sometimes the first step in the right direction. That's actually the title of this message. Falling is the first step. Because when you fall flat on your face and you realize how weak you are and how much help you need, that's when you get back up and you learn to hold on to God like never before. And let him lead you forward. You don't have to walk it alone. God walks it with you. And he gives you a new start every time you fail. You know what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17? It says, if any man be a new in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's an important verse for all of us to hear, especially some of us. Those of us who think there's no reason for me to even try to live like a Christian because I can't do it anyway. I'll just fall. Yeah. The Bible says God wants to take all your failures, all your fallings, all the things that make you feel naked and ashamed, things you'd be humiliated for anybody else in this room to know about. God wants to flush all that down, down the, all that down the toilet, and may it end up in the depths of the sea. God is not going backwards. You're going forwards. God is going forward. You can walk with him. You can walk with him in harmony. And you can wind up in a garden after all. Now, here's one last verse. It's Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Do you remember I said the Bible starts in a garden? And it ends in a garden. Remember how there was a tree of, there was this tree 
in the old garden that we can't go back to? Well, the Bible says there's a tree in the garden of God to which we're headed. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That's where God's headed. Is that where you're headed? That's where God's going. And he wants you to go with him. And I'd sure like to talk with you about how you can make sure you're right with him and that you're walking in harmony with him.